Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first South African recording of Hustle Academy Brings You. Please help me welcome our speaker, founder and CEO of Zolzi.com, Donald Valoy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Nice and to see you as well. And for the moment as well, I see. Yeah, you're yeah, always ready for the moment mm -hmm. and very excited to be here as well. Which is, you know, the hustling way. Yeah, of Donald, course. Donald, I guess, as you know, the Hustle Academy is a free boot camp geared to help young upcoming small business owners really build the skills that they need to, to scale their business, right? And yeah. one of the things that we've heard from them is skills building is great. Access yeah. to finance is great. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need a bit of a shot in the arm of inspiration and to hear the lessons from people who have walked this path and gone through what they're probably going through at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Hence, you being here, right? And I think wise pe wiser people than me often say that, you know, in every crisis there's opportunity. And I suppose the pandemic has really unlocked e-commerce in South Africa in a huge way. And e-commerce growth, particularly in grocery, is outstripping all growth expectations at the moment. So would love to know a little bit from you around, you know, why Zolzi.com and just, you know, your journey to date. Yeah, no, uh, thank you so much. Um, I mean, Zulzi started in 2013 as an e-commerce platform. We used to sell books, electronics to students. Uh, and then 2016, we evolved to become like a super app where we aggregated different retailers. Uh, we also have like restaurant at the time. But after a year of launching the super app, we decided to scale down a little bit to focus a lot more on groceries. Uh, at the time, it was, uh, it was a strange decision from my side mm -hmm. because at the time, I mean, uh, I remember at month six, we were doing about one million rand a month GMV. Uh, and then I made a call that, you know what, we're going to focus on the 100,000 rand that we're doing at the time for groceries. So the one million rand, 100,000 rand was groceries, 900,000 rand was fast food. Uh, we decided to focus on groceries. The reason why we decided to focus on groceries, I looked at groceries as something that I was going to pick up very quickly. It's one of the categories that was not well penetrated here in South Africa. Right. When I looked at the food space on the other side, there was a lot of players like Mr. D, the, uh, the Uber Eats as well. So they were going aggressively in that space. So from our side, it, uh, the groceries made sense that, you know what, like we, it's better for us to focus on that category because that category, like there wasn't a lot of players and it's a challenging category as well. So we started building a lot of system to support how to shop groceries online, get it delivered within an hour. We introduced one hour delivery in South Africa back then in those days before anyone could think about one hour delivery. And I mean, thank you. I see it's gone to 15 minutes now. Yeah, yeah. So like uh, when, we're, when we're delivering within one hour, we're picking from different retailers. So we used to aggregate like different retailers, like we were at pick and pay all the big retailers here in South Africa. And then, um, yeah, and then in doing that, you know, some of the biggest retailers as well noticed us in terms of what we're doing. Uh, so we partnered with one of the biggest retailers. We actually did a tech for them. Uh, and then from there, then on the Zulzi side, we then decided that, you know, I think it's best for us to change the model a little bit. And then we started op uh, opening our own uh, dark stores. We call them dark stores. So in those stores, what we do is we get products directly from the FMCGs, and then they deliver them to our dark stores. And then we're able to then ship those products to the customers within 15 minutes. Very clever. I love what you were saying there around, I guess, two things, right? The, uh, the willingness to focus right, and place a big bet on honestly what at this time, I guess, sounded like, you know, a strategic hope, let's call it, but a, you know, a belief that the category would grow and that you'd be able to compete more effectively. That's a big chunk of your business to walk away from. Yeah, look, I think, uh, you know, as a startup, you always have to look for that, right? And you must be realistic as well in terms of like how far you, you know, like if we look at, if we look at South Africa as well, right, I think our market cannot take more than you know, three, four players, depending on how big the category is. You know, I mean, we've already seen that in the e-commerce space. Take a lot have really dominated that space in terms of like, you know, just electronics and all those categories. Uh, and what was up for grabs was, you know, groceries, you know, uh, where you can actually have someone like Zuz who's independent, who can really dominate that space. So it's always important to look at uh, what is it that is coming in the future. You mm. know, don't try, don't try and want to compete in mature categories, unless you're going to do something radically different from what they're doing. You know, you can't replicate the same thing and hope for the best. So from our side, it made sense that, you know, uh, we have to look at the category that is underpenetrated and, and do more and do a lot of work on it. And I think we, we did, like, when I look back now, I think we did 
some very good things in terms of like just driving the one hour delivery in South Africa and really also helping some of the retailers to become like, you know, dominant within the one hour delivery space. And then on our side as well, like, you know, the 15 minute delivery that we are we have introduced where now customers can shop from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. That has really changed the game in South Africa, you know. So so we we always looking for those things in terms of what is the next category that we can bring online. So mm -hmm. for instance, even now, we are actually like launching prescriptions as well. So within next week, as a customer, you should be able to sort of like upload your prescription script on the Zozi platform and get your medication delivered in 15 minutes, you know. So that again is another category that we are changing, you know, radically in South Africa. So be clear on your competition, be clear on your potential sources of differentiation and constantly innovate. Yeah, you, you always have to do that. And, and, and also another thing is in the tech space, you must realize that you're competing with everyone in the world, you mm. know. Uh, you, you, you know, when you, you do these things, you can't afford to just do it in a room, uh, you know, without looking at what else is the world doing, you know. Every time we do something, every time we innovate, someone will come and want to copy the same thing, you know. So you can't just say, you know what, you were great last year or year before last, or your mom said you were great and then that's it, you know. <laughs> so you have to keep on innovating. So we, that's what we do as Uzi. We keep on innovating, we keep on changing the game. Uh, we keep on looking for new ideas. We also keep on looking for talent as well, right? We we hire a lot of young, uh, smart engineers, local guys, you know, most of them straight from varsity. You know, we bring them in, we train them, you know, we use even like very exciting languages, you know, things like Rust, you know, uh, Golang. Those are the things that we use in the Zuzi, uh, to build our Zuzi platforms. And then every time we build something, uh, I mean, when we started, for instance, our super app uh, was based on Scala, when we change that now to the dark stores, now we're using Rust, you know. So we are also not fixated in terms of like which technology to use. We keep on uh, looking to use the latest technologies and that also help us to sort of like attract the best talent uh, in, in the country and to mold them to be, you know, uh, world-class engineers, you know. Uh, for me, I'm always very excited when I look at, you know, some of the engineers when they leave uh, mm -hmm. our company, uh, they always go overseas and work for amazing great uh, companies as well outside the country and just as shows you uh, the talent that we're building that is locally made as well. I love that. I love yeah. that. Look, you've, you've spoken a little bit around setting up the business for growth, but would love, I suppose, just your top tips or advice for other businesses around, you know, what are some of the key things that need to be in place to set up your business for growth, right, and to drive continuous growth throughout your business? And the only way to know is you have to go out there, right? Uh, it doesn't help for one to think about this idea and you don't implement things, you know. You always have to think, you know, in the office, uh, I always ask the guys, you know, what can you do now, mm. you know. Because it's easy for one to think about, oh, tomorrow I'm going to do X, Y, Z, right. Uh, but you always have to take a step today to say, today, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and then when you start taking actions, then it becomes natural to you, you know. Every day you're taking actions and then you get to see as well what, what are things that are not working, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you just keep on dreaming you might not see it quick enough in terms of what is it that's not working. So you always have to say, today, let me try one thing and very quickly. Even from a tech perspective as well, we do the same thing to say, guys, can we actually get the features out as quickly as possible so that we can give them to the customers so customers can tell us whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. So being able to move quickly with speed is important. So you have to pick for one thing that you think will move your business to the next level. Who do you hire next, you know? Yeah. Who are the, uh, the type of people that you are bringing to your company? You know, are those guys uh, going to move and understand where you're going as well? So that is very critical as a founder to actually understand the type of resources that you need at any given mm -hmm. time and make sure that you really, really, like, look for the best talent out there in the world. Gosh, I'm hearing a lot. I'm hearing focus. I am hearing continuous learning and test and learn, actually. I am hearing, you know, being agile and kind of like, you know, 80% yeah. there, but just get it done and learn from it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then I'm hearing the importance of people, right, both from a culture fit point of view, but I'm supposing also from a disruptive thinking point of view and kind of challenging the status quo a little bit yeah. internally as well. For me, what I've always believed in is getting people who have the passion and the drive, you know, uh, most of the stuff doesn't matter, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, like, if you look at, like, e-commerce, for instance, Anyone who says about 15, 20 years experience in South Africa in e-commerce for groceries, it's not worthwhile to have that experience, right? You need people who are going to be driven by passion, you know? 
And that's what we applied. You know, I mean, I remember when we built, when we started building one of the, the platform, one of the biggest, actually the biggest grocery delivery platform now in South Africa, right? In, even in Africa. We actually, the team that was assembled in the beginning, it was a team of young engineers, you know, graduates straight from university. And today those guys, after three, four years, the architects, they are doing amazing things, you know? So really looking for people that are driven is critical, you know, to build a successful in the business. So for me, the most important thing is I don't look for, do you have a lot of experience? I look at, can you learn this thing? You know, if given an opportunity, can you learn this thing? Can you do it quickly? Because even from our side, that's where we came from. You know, when we started, I remember a lot of guys will, will question, can you guys do this online? Can you do that? You have never, you don't have any experience on this, you know? But because of that passion and hunger to sort of like, you know, break those barriers, you know? I, I mean, here in South Africa, for instance, you know, a space like e-commerce was dominated by like mostly like also like white people, right? But we had to sort of like change that narrative to say, actually, mm. you can have black engineers we can build something great, something amazing, something that actually, you know, if we look, anyone, anyone else can compete with it, you know, in the country. So those are the things that, if you have the passion, you can build anything. That resonates really strongly with me. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot from our graduates is that, you know, they face a couple of big challenges. There's the skills. Yeah. And then there is access to financing, which, you know, in turn kind of curtails or supports being able to expand the business, being able to hire more people, you know, and, and, and. Um, would be good to hear from you just how you approached getting financing and investment into, into Zolzi. Look, I must say for us, it, it, it was very tough, right? Like, uh, you know, like uh, we finance the business mostly by using our own capital, mm -hmm. right? Like we... I mean, when we started, for instance, we, I mentioned we used to sell books online. Uh, you know, fortunately for us, we were able to scale that business in the big, in the early early mm -hmm. days, and then we were able to get some cash from that. Uh, and then we, from that, we also like, uh, you know, in the early days of selling groceries as well, we didn't have any funder. Uh, a lot of people actually wanted us to wanted to see like big numbers before they can commit to something. You know, so one of the things that I learned back then was to rely a lot on friends. So I built amazing relationship with a lot of people in terms of, you know, like uh, people who can actually help you to borrow your cash. So for me, like, uh, and I didn't, I must put a disclaimer, I didn't have rich friends, right? Uh, the most important thing was just building that trust. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, you'll be very surprised that a lot of people can help you, but you need to have that trust with that person. So for me, in the early days, it was so critical for us to have that trust where, you know, a lot of guys could lend us money, and then we return it back. That's also very important because, you know, when, when you, someone borrows your cash, you know, uh, if you don't return it back, then you're building a bad name for yourself, right? And no one wants to give it to you. So that is, was so critical, even though it was difficult. I mean, I would have friends where I would borrow cash and I was thinking, you know what, maybe within a month I'll be able to return it back. But I'll go for a year without returning it back. But I would communicate with them and assure them that, guys, things are just tough, you know? Mm. Uh, and then, yeah, and then I think we got our, our first break when one of the retailers decided to partner with us to say, we need you guys to help us because we see what you've been doing. You guys have been doing amazing work in the grocery space. We don't think there's anyone who can match you guys. Can you guys come in and help us to build our platform, right? And then that gave us, you know, some cash, you know. Uh, but, you know, without us doing that work in the beginning, no one could have noticed what we're capable of doing, even though I knew at that time that we can actually build better tech than everyone else, but it wasn't there for everybody to see it. Mm. So if, as an entrepreneur, don't just go out there and think people owe you something mm. or companies who are funders, they owe you something. No one owes you anything, right? So you need to go there with that approach to say, you know what, I need to, I need to sort of like get the guys to buy into the vision. And what's easy is actually people around you who see you every day we'll see how passionate you are. Those are the guys who should back you first. So what I'm hearing is the importance of a network that is based on trust and reliability and kind of credibility as underpinning that, right? So it's showing up and doing what you said you do. It's very critical. And, and I think that network is your network. It's the network that you have now. You can't just go to another network and hope mm. that people will trust you immediately, right? So people who will trust you are people who, who you sit with every day who you go to coffee, you, you go wherever with, you know. Some of them, you don't even know how much 
they have in their bank account, whatever the case is. But the moment you start like building the trust, uh, it's something that is so critical. And that's also how everybody, like they do business, you know, in terms of funding, all of those things, right? It's about trust. Can I trust you with my money? Can I trust you with X, Y, Z? Have you demonstrated that you're actually a trustworthy person? So those are the critical things that as young business owners, we need to develop, mm -hmm. you know? Being able to communicate, for instance, when things are tough. You don't communicate when things are great. You communicate more when things are tough. To say, guys, hang on a second. That promise that I've made, I'm, I won't be able to do it. You know. So those are the critical things that, as a small business owner, you have to learn those things. Walking the walk. Yeah. I like that. Um, I'm sure it wasn't all smooth sailing. You know, you've kind of given me the, hey, we've, we're grown, we've gotten a couple of lucky break story now, now I'm going to kind of pivot the conversation and ask a bit around, you know, have there been some big mistakes and what have you learned from those mistakes? I mean, one of the biggest mistakes that I remember very well that almost shut down the whole business was uh, when we were running our business, we we didn't have a secure, uh, what do you call it, delete secure on, mm -hmm. on, on, on our platform. So a delete secure allows you to sort of like uh, have an OTP. So when you buy online, you get an OTP, it's sort of like to sort of like a online secure safety, your card, yes. all right? So we didn't have that, you know? Uh, and then, uh, so as a, as a customer, we just go on the platform. For us, from our side, we were just thinking, you know what, like this makes it much easier for customers because the other one has got a lot of drop-offs. The other one doesn't have a lot of drop-offs. If you go in with a card, uh, no OTP, it just goes in, mm. you know, via motor account, right? Um, so, that happened, it was good when the company was still small. And then when we were growing, a lot of people started to notice that, oh, you know, if I just take anyone's card, I can just go in and buy stuff in this platform, right? And then we started having a lot of fraudulent transaction to a point where the bank decided not to release the cash. So our cash that the customers were buying from us couldn't get it back for like three or four days. And we didn't have that kind of working capital uh, to sustain us for that long, you know? Uh, and at that time, you know, from our side, it was a mistake, you know, not to have followed the right processes in the beginning, you know, and that almost shut down the whole business. You know, I had to sort of like negotiate with the bank, uh, plead with them for a message, you know, uh, tell them our story, how many people were hiring, uh, how young we were at the time. So those are some of the mistakes that we made, you know, uh, but those mistakes still continue every day. You know, uh, the mistakes are, it's part of the learnings, you know, you, you continue to make mistakes, whether if it's hiring the wrong person, all of those things. Uh, but you shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. You just have to learn from them, you know? So every day when I look back, I'm like, okay, cool, that mistake was worth it because now you know better. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what kind of, how to eliminate risks. Uh, every time you look at an opportunity as well, you know where, what things you should not be looking for, you know? So it's part of you uh, growing your business. I like that. You spoke a little earlier about you know, being free to focus on the things that matter. And so I would love to know, you know, as a head of a business and particularly a business that's growing, yep. how do you find that balance between kind of like the big stuff, right? The vision and the strategy and, you know, the where are we going big picture kind of thinking yep. and the more operational details. So how do you find that balance? What is important for you as, a, as an owner as well is to really deep dive in terms of like understanding every time you change the strategy as well, do you really understand what it takes to build it, you know? Mm. Uh, because it's easy for one to go and just hire people to say, today I need a warehouse manager, I need one, two, three, four, but without you understanding what it takes. Mm. So for me, what I normally do is I actually, I go deep in terms of understanding everything before I make hires. Then after that, then you go and say, you know what, now that I understand what is needed, and I know who's the right person, because if you have never done it, you'll never know as well who's the right person to do the job. Right. So that has really helped me in terms of like really finding the right people to do the job because you sort of like have an idea of what kind of person you're looking for. Right. And of course, like, uh, you know, I've also indicated that currently we are busy on the healthcare uh, uh, space where we are really like uh, all our dark stores will now have the, uh, the pharmacy license where you can now order your prescription medication and all of those things. Uh, and, and, and that's another vision that I'll have. And then after that, once I've gone through in terms of implementing one dog store, the same thing, you hire the right people, leave them to run with it, you know. So I'm always like thinking about the next thing, but you need to make sure also like whatever you have that you have built now, you must leave it with the right people in the good hands so they can continue to grow it. I guess follow-up question on that, right? How do you 
develop your spidey sense to find the right talent, right, to get those right people. Because it's not just, I suppose it's not just about the hard skills, it's also about fitting into the organisation and kind of like aligning with the vision. So what is your secret sauce for finding the right people? Well, I actually get very much involved, right, yeah. in terms of, uh, you know, like, even like just setting up the initial chat with whoever, whether if it's in tech space or, or marketing, whatever. And where I've, I've found things to work better for us is just having a casual talk with people, you know, not having a formal interview, yeah. right? I've had a lot of good talent who, like, when I look back, I can see that the reason why they were so good and I could, I could assess it is because they were honest with me. Because actually, a lot of interviews, the problem with people is they, they are not honest. You know, you find that they want a job, yeah. they're desperate for a job, so they can tell you anything that you want to hear. But the moment it's just a casual talk, right, and you're just talking about stuff, or someone just came to the office looking for something or from another company being sent to me, uh, you know, those casual talks then leads to another thing to say, oh, okay, cool. Uh, then how would you do X, Y, Z? How would you solve this problem? And not thinking as an interview. And then before you know it, you're in, you know? Uh, and then from a tech side, of course, I think uh, looking at, you know, uh, uh, guys, young talent, guys who are open to learn things. Yeah. So I prefer guys who, you know, sh must show you that they've done something on their own right, you know? Uh, you know, like if you're at varsity, you are not just studying only, you have developed something that we can see. You know, can you show us a platform? Can you show us an app that you've developed on your own uh, spare time? This is a bit of an obvious question, I suppose, for somebody in the tech space, but beyond being the platform that you actually deliver your product on, how do you think digital tools and channels, what role do you think that it plays in helping entrepreneurs to grow their businesses? You know, if you think about both your own experience, but also just, you know, in general, small businesses in general. Yeah, look, I think digital platforms, are they've opened up the, you know, the if you look at the retail, for instance, I don't think for us we would have had an opportunity to play in the retail space if you look at the capital that is needed beforehand. Not to say that it does not require a lot of capital. It does require a lot of capital to scale. But for you to start, it's easy. Mm. You know, so there's, the starting capital is not a lot of money, you know. In fact, what is needed there is just the ideas, the passion and the execution, you know. Uh, once you have that, then it's easy to, to get in, you know. So I think for me, the digital channels have really opened up the space. You look at advertising as well, you know, like, you know, just buying Google ads as an example is much easier, right, than having a billboard that you have to pay 100,000 rand. You can go and pay Google ads for, for 10 bucks, 20 bucks, and see if your idea is good or not, you know. So the digital platforms are really, uh, I would say they've created like a leveling field where anyone can come in and mm -hmm. participate in it, you know. Uh, so so I think for me, and it's only going to get better and better, you know, as you can see here yeah, in South Africa, in terms of the things that we used to complain about, like the devices that people don't have, the smart devices, we now all have them, you know. Uh, you're talking about the internet as well, the penetration of internet. Today, as we speak, you'll see that a lot of townships are getting high-speed uh, internet as well. Fiber is, you know, is going to the townships as we speak today. So the leveling field is just continuing every now and then, you know. And, and I think what is important then from the uh, guys who want to build businesses is to take advantage of that, you know, mm. because everything is really moving online. The problems that were there are getting solved. Everybody is actually getting, uh, you know, solving the issues of affordability, high-speed internet. Everybody is solving those issues. So that means that we're going to have a big opportunity for anyone who wants to play in the space to participate in it. I think that's so true, right? Digital both lowers the barriers to entry yeah. and gives you disproportionate scale, actually. Exactly, exactly. You know, uh, you know, like, I mean, I looked at us as, as a business as well, you know, how we've been able to scale and servicing people that are not even, you don't even know them, you're not related mm -hmm. to you. You know, uh, you've never seen them. Some of them, they just, oh, you are the Zuzi guy. Like, oh, okay, cool. We didn't know that. You know, those are the things that are possible. You know, so I think digital have really, like, you know, has opened up a lot of doors. Mm. And I think young people need to take advantage of that. You know, you don't want to miss out on this, on this boom. You know, you have to get in and find a way to get involved in it. Look, and if there's one, one thing that I think comes through as such a strong theme when engaging with entrepreneurs is that, right? Like that ability to spot an opportunity and kind of like make the most of it. So absolutely, that, that really resonates.
four out of five South African small businesses fail within their first five years of operations. Mm-hmm. Right? And so sustainability, I think, is on all of our minds, right? How do you survive to kind of blow out the candles on your five-year birthday cake. Um, so what advice do you have for small business owners around putting you know, in place the measures to bake in sustainability and kind of make it through those first years? Yeah, I think, I think you know, running a business requires a lot. You know, um, it's not just one thing. It's not just having an idea. It's, for instance, understanding things like compliance, understanding, you know, finance, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, you know, so those things really, you know, like don't, go into business thinking just because I'm good with one thing, then that's a business, you know. It will require you to upskill yourself as well, you know. If you have to go and learn different things in terms of like, you know, uh, how do I do projections? How do I do X, Y, Z? How do I do my budgets? All of those things, you'll have to do it, you know, as the owner of a business. So I think there's many things that, you know, when you go and run a business, you're going to have to learn how to do it by yourself, you know. I remember the early days, for instance, of Zuzi. You know, I used to deliver groceries. You know, I was a delivery man. Uh, I'll go back. Instagram was managed by me, you know. So you go and complain. You're complaining to the same guy who was delivering to you, you know. <laughs> so those are the things, you know, that you, you, you have to get your hands dirty and really, really start to understand what really drives your business, you know. And, of course, the unit economics also makes sense. You must know how you're going to make money, mm. you know, how you're going to make money. Because sometimes there's always this excitement, you know, you have this idea, it's a great idea, but you find that there's no way to monetize on it, you know. So you always have to think about, like, when all is done and all is good and everybody is celebrated, how do we make money, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that is important. And you need to figure that from, from day one, you know. Uh, you know, there's always this uh, a lot of people in tech thinking in South Africa, no, you can just get in, like, you know, even in the U.S., they think some businesses are like in the U.S., but even the U.S., the same thing. You know, there's always, uh, you know, there, there must be a, a vision on how, or not only the vision only, but how we're going to make money. Like, it must be clear, because there's always this confusion in terms of, if you look at, like, a lot of e-commerce businesses, right, they, they will raise a lot of capital, and you hear that they're loss-making. And then a lot of entrepreneurs get motivated by that to say, I also can have a loss-making business, but without fully understanding why they are loss-making. Mm. Because some businesses in the e-commerce space, they will be loss-making because that's what they have decided to do. But the case was proven in the beginning. It's not like they just started from day one and they were loss-making. You find that the case was proven that with 100 customers, we can be profitable, and this is how we are profitable. But then you find that maybe investors come and say, you know what, let's rather take this to the next level Let's give you the funding, a lot of funding, so we can capture everyone and get into this thing. So you find that then there's a vision to say, okay, let's change the vision, and now let's just focus on what? On customer acquisition. But that's not what must inspire, uh, inspire young people to say, you know, if there's a business that's loss-making, I must just create one as well. I don't have to figure out a way on how to make money. That you must find out from day one to say, how are you going to make money? And then once you have figured it out, then, you know, you can do the rest. If the, if the funders come and say, yes, cash, Let's focus on scale, then we can do it. So know how you're going to create value and charge for that value, ultimately, right? Exactly. You have to you have to know that, you know, mm-hmm. and also really try and look into the future as well, right? Don't be stuck on what's happening now, right? Uh, look into the future in terms of like how will this look like, you know? Uh, because also like you know what what helps what what when you look into the future, how is it going to help you? It eliminates a lot of competition, a lot of big companies that you know of, they are worried about their problems of today. But not a lot of companies are worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So that's the gap for small business to start thinking, how do I solve these issues? So you need to start positioning yourself in terms of what happens when we, you know, you must sometimes sit and imagine the world where everybody is now buying online and ask yourself what opportunities will be there? Because there will be opportunities, a lot of them, you know. There'll be a lot of other things that can be done, you know. Other businesses can be created, you know. I mean, you look at even a business like Airbnb where people book for houses, you know, using a platform. Now other businesses are coming in to say, how do you administrate the, the, the whole process of you getting the keys, all of that stuff. Those are the opportunities that are created that people can take advantage of. 
Donald, that was a great segue to my next question around finding your next growth horizon, right? Um, you spoke a little earlier around moving from grocery to pharmacy. And so I'm curious, what advice do you have around how, how you find that next growth horizon and business opportunity? If you look at prescription items, if you're sick and you just came from a doctor, you know, you don't want to go to a pharmacy. It makes sense that convenience must help. Mm -hmm. And that's why then from Zuzi's side, then we're saying, you know, if you go to a doctor, you have a script, we then give you the ability to sort of like upload your prescription and get your medication delivered, you know, within 15 minutes. Uh, you know, what motivated us to do that? We looked at the market in terms of how big that market is. We looked at the regulations as well. Uh, and then we realized that the time was right now to do that. You know, there was a time where, in fact, we were looking to do, to implement the same thing in terms of getting the script, prescription, medication delivered to you, but the regulation could not allow that, you know. So we had to sort of like uh, go through the channels to sort of like get the right licenses, uh, you know, hire the right people, have a pharmacist as well, so that then you can be able to do the, the script online, you know. Uh, so those are some of the things uh, you have to sort of like... Uh, you know, understand legislation, understand also in terms of like how big is the market size and then see if you can implement technology to solve the problem. So what I'm hearing is a couple of things, right? Like rather find opportunities that are adjacent to your core business because you're able to extend some of your own expertise. Um, and I'm supposing, you know, from a supply chain point of view as well, you know, that that's a lot more complementary. Yeah. I'm hearing being true to your value proposition, actually, right? So yours very much being focused on convenience and speed, yeah. right? It might make less sense to go into furniture. Yeah. Um, but so being very clear around your value proposition and then the devil is in the details, I guess my third th takeaway there around, you know, yeah. being clear around the, the market landscape and what opportunities arise or are prevented as a result of that. Definitely. I think, uh, and also like it's easy for, when it's on the outside, it's easy to think these things are related, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, for us, lucky for us, we, when we started with a super app, we were selling food online, <laughs> groceries online, but we saw how complex or how dif different those categories were, right? Uh, and, and to a point where you, you can see that the guys who are more likely to dominate the categories are the guys who have just so focused on that category. It's so difficult even for super apps to have a super app that will be number one on food, mm. on groceries, on pharmacy. And even for small business, you have to know that, you know, because sometimes you spend a lot of time, you are afraid of going to something because you think there's a big guy there, you know. Big guys, most of the time, will only be good at one. There's a legacy problem already that they come with, that the only thing that they will be good at is this thing, you know. Uh, you know, if you're creating a super app and you find that you have done well in the food space, it becomes difficult to become number one in the grocery space, you know. So, so those are the opportunities that people should be looking out for to say, how do I then tackle this? Because the guys who win in any space, it's guys who are thinking about these things every day. Mm. Problem is to solve one thing, you wake up, you go to bed, you think about the same problem, then you will find the right solution. So specialization, but also, you know, there's strength and smallness, I guess, right? Like being able to be nimble and yeah. Bring a fresh perspective, so don't be afraid to to challenge large competitors. No, no, definitely, definitely. But also be realistic a, a little bit, you know. If you're going to challenge them, you must know that you've got a weapon that's going to destroy them, you know. Uh, if you don't have that, then, you know, stay away from them. <laughs> Fair enough. Don't become a part of the st statistics. Yeah. Um, now I'm going to ask you to kind of, like, do the big picture for me here, but what is your vision for small businesses in Africa? I think sm small businesses, the way I looked at them is they are big businesses, actually. You know, so in terms of employment, employment will come from small businesses, right? So for me, I think what needs to happen is we need to start giving better support to, to small businesses, uh, even from a funding perspective, to help them to scale, you know? Uh, and also for big corporates as well, where they can give a, a hand to small businesses, I think it will help a lot to our economy. Uh, and it must not be looked at as, you know, if you're a big corporate, if I give you a helping hand, now it must become a division of my business, you know. we I want to see more small businesses become more independent on their own right. I want to see uh, us creating more big companies, you know, that we can actually look 
four years down the line and say, these are the small, these companies used to be small businesses about five years ago. Today they're here, they're listed in the GSC. So for me, that's the vision that I want to see in South Africa where we can actually create more of companies that are going to be listed on the GSC that we can look back and say, here's a proof of what we can get when you support a small business. Big business loading. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, based on, on that vision, right, of independent kind of sustainable small businesses that are able to, to really grow and go all the way, what do you think needs to change in the ecosystem to support that? Look, I think, uh, I think the first thing is, is, is the capital, right? Uh, I think the capital needs to be made available. I believe we've got a lot of capital, but it's just not deployed the right way in South Africa, you know? Uh, I don't believe a lot of businesses should, should struggle, you know, when the capital's there, you know? So if, if guys have got great ideas and they've shown that there's traction and they can, they can assemble great talent, I think then what's next is how do we support them, you know, from the VC communities uh, to, you know, even the government to some extent, you know? And the reason why I'm saying this as well is I looked at our journey as well and I looked at the missed opportunities that were there, you know, even from the VC communities, you know, most of them, they always come back when you are, you require a big check and they're like, ah, you know, but now, you know, what you're asking for can help you, mm. you know. And then, I, and then I look back and I'm like, but there are so many guys that are doing something now. Why aren't you helping those guys, you know? So it's always about, you know, like, a, and I, it's a tricky situation as well, right? Because, I mean, in our space, you find that uh, even the VC space is not matured enough. It's not like, so you've got people who are starting businesses. You've got a VC that's not matured enough as well to understand how do you back these things? Are we backing these things for ourselves as well, you know? Because there's another part that needs to, there must be some alignment as well, even from entrepreneurs as well is, you know, sometimes you could build a business just to sell, you know, even a VC as well, you need to have that goal and vision to say, are we actually going to stick it out for 10 years or five years? Mm. And if we want to exit in a year, what are we going to focus on? You know, because some guys sometimes maybe just building so that you can sell is good, you know, uh, and you find that there's always that opportunity, but you find that because sometimes the mandate is not well defined. So you look for the wrong things as well, you know, and also understanding in terms of like, how does what, what a typical startup, how does it look like in South Africa? You know, because sometimes you find that you want to apply a lot of corporate governance in a startup where you're not going to have that, you know? Mm. Uh, so when you go to a startup, you must be ready to understand that a startup, maybe they might not have uh, financials as an example, you know? Maybe they are not compliant on one, two, three, four, but those things can be fixed, you know? And those are the easy things, you know? But for me, the key things is, can you build, like as an example in South Africa, for instance, you know, one of the biggest problems that I know is, you know, to find people who can build amazing technology is hard. It's really difficult, you know, you know, a lot of people have ideas, but can you have people who can implement technology and scale it uh, and, and can and become world-class, you know, it's mm -hmm. very hard. So for me, I would then say, if anyone finds someone who can do that, back them. And I'm hearing, which I think is one of the core, core themes that we've, we've heard as we've engaged with entrepreneurs is around just how do you, simplify access to capital so that you don't have to, you know, raid your best friend's mattress or, as the case might be, to, uh, to find that financing. So thank you very much. That has given us such great insights. And let me recap a couple of the big things that I've heard here, right? I've heard focus. I've heard, you know, being clear on the opportunities of where growth is going to come from and where you can really make your competitive advantage shine. And I've really heard how important surrounding yourself with the right people are in, uh, in driving value in your business. Definitely. Thank you very much for your time. No, it was amazing. And thank you so much for your time as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Could we have another round of applause for Donald? <laughs>